Okay guys, today I want to do a quick video lecture over two topics, devolution and boundaries. So um, a lot, devolution is kind of a funny word and when we talk about devolution I want you to think about it, it is the opposite of evolution. So evolution is something growing and um, becoming bigger and more and devolution is the opposite. It's something breaking down. So as you can see here in this graphic, devolution is the transfer of political power from a central to a subnational government. So, uh, of course, some of you may have heard recently, of course, the Scottish are trying to get power um, from the United Kingdom. And so that's one example of devolution. So. The technical definition of devolution is the process by where regions within a state demand and gain political strength and growing autonomy at the expense of the central government. So what that means is that the central government or the state or country's government is going to give away some of its powers. As we've already studied so far uh, in this unit, that would be like a federal government giving some of the powers to the state, the county, and the municipal governments. Some of the devolutionary forces that we see a lot, um, one of them is physical geography, and that is just creating distance or space between uh, groups of people that make them not feel connected. The second is ethnic separatism, and that is ethnic groups do not feel like they're, um, you know, part and so because they don't feel connected then they want to separate and of course the last one is economics those are the big three economic and social issues are going to cause people to want to break up kind of think of it um, when you're thinking about a relationship where people can't get along because they can't agree on who will pay the rent um, it's kind of the same way with countries one region doesn't like to have to pay a lot of taxes to carry other poor regions. Two others that are sometimes involved are terrorism and irredentism. Remember, uh, irredentism is when a group is trying to get uh, some of their basic uh, rights back and gain territory, and so that's a movement where they're trying to get their territory that they once held back. So when we talk about devolution, remember it's expressed in the fragmentation of states into autonomous regions. So the question you have to ask yourself is, what is an autonomous region? Well, remember, an autonomous region is when a country or region starts to act independently, or at least they have the right to do so. Now, they may still be part of that state, a.k.a. country but they start getting some rights, some self-determination. Some examples are going to be like in Canada, you have none of it territory. Um, that is an, a territory way up north in uh, far northern the uh, uh, Arctic portions of Canada. And then also some of our Native American reservations. On the Native American reservations here in the United States, they don't always have to follow the same laws. They actually have a completely different police force on those reservations. So that's being autonomous. Now let's talk about the first major type of devolution, and that's ethnocultural devolution. When we talk about ethnocultural devolutionary movements, it's people, they feel like they are culturally different from the majority. So usually you're talking about a, a minority of people who are, they don't feel connected to the majority, so they want more sovereignty. Remember that word, sovereignty. They want the right to rule themselves, more self-determination. So um, what we're seeing, though, is this is starting to happen all over the world. Uh, in the 1990s, 1980s, we saw it happen a lot in Europe, but we're seeing it happen more and more in Southwest Asia or the Middle East with groups like the Palestinians and the Kurds. So this is an example, obviously, of Europe. You can see the map here, and this shows you what they look like um, before, uh, in, you know, World War I started. And you can see you had the Austro-Hungarian Empire here. Um, and you had the Russian Empire, and what we'll notice is after, you can see that you've got two separate states. 
you have Austria and Hungary. Um, the Soviet Union, of course, comes in, but you can also see you have East, East Germany and West Germany. Those are examples of devolution. Of course, nowhere has it been more present as here in the southern part of Europe. Southern part of Europe used to have a country called Yugoslavia, but in the 1990s there was a huge civil war here, and after the breakup of Russia, a lot of these nations of people wanted to break apart, and so you had fragmentation. So you got Croatia and Bosnia and Serbia, the country of Montenegro is about to form. Also you had Kosovo, Macedonia. Um, and so what we're starting to see more and more are that when nations of people don't want to be ruled over anymore, they start asking for devolution. Devolution isn't only happening in Europe. Like I said, it's also starting to happen more and more in uh, Southwest Asia, also known as the Middle East. You can see these are all the different tribes of people. If you look at the key here, these are different groups of people, nations of people who would like to have their independence or the right to self-rule. Look at the country of Iraq by itself. You can see these are all tribes or nations of people. Now you know why there's a lot of political fragmentation there. The next type of devolutionary force is economic devolution. Of course, this happens when regions want more control over the money or the revenue that they're bringing in. They want more control over the production of goods and also over their trade. They feel like if they split away from the state, they would have more control. Um, a perfect example here is Northern Italy. Northern Italy, um, they really are tired. They're a very wealthy region of Italy, and they are very tired of all of their taxes going to help the southern regions of Italy, which are very poor. And so they're tired of having to kind of carry them along. And so they would like to split up and form their own country. Also, you have spatial devolutionary forces. This is when you have places, they are very far from uh, the, the capital or the center of population and they want more sovereignty. Uh, an example of this would be Hawaii. Hawaii, of course, is separated from mainland United States by around a thousand miles. And so they don't feel connected to the United States like maybe we do here in Texas because they're so far. Remember, spatial means space. So they're, they are separated by a lot of area or space or distance. So these are some examples of devolution. If you look on the left-hand side, okay, these are all states that have split up. So like we talked about, the former Yugoslavia is now seven or eight different independent states. You've got the former uh, Soviet Union here, which is now Russia and about 15 other independent states. You have the country of Czechoslovakia, who is now the Czech Republic and Slovakia. And then you have Austria-Hungary, which split into separate countries of Austria and Hungary. Of course, these are places where today we're seeing devolutionary movements. In the United Kingdom, of course, Scotland's tried to break away and would love to continue. In Spain, you've got the Basque and the Catalonians who would love to break away. We just talked about Italy's issues. And then France, um, the island of Corsica, would like to become their own independent state. So there's still a lot of movement in Europe towards devolution. All right, the next thing I want to talk about real quick is about boundaries. So when we talk about boundaries, boundaries, a definition of it is a vertical plane that cuts through the subsoil and the airspace, and it divides one state from another. There are two important words that I want you to pay attention to here. Subsoil, which means underneath the surface, and airspace, which extends above the surface. We're not just talking about... Um, the, the surface and where you see a sign or a fence separating two areas. We're talking about 
everything in the air, the, the water, the minerals, and the resources that are in our ground. So when we look at this graphic, this shows us, see this, this is the vertical plane, all right? Everything in green is country B, everything in yellow is country A. So we have to really pay attention here to the subsoil. Subsoil is an issue because sometimes one country might be able to drill or mine over into another country's um, subsoil. And that creates a problem because no one wants their resources taken away because that's where there's a lot of money in the ground. Of course, we pay attention to the airspace up here because airspace has to do with our national security. We don't want another country's planes flying into our airspace without permission to do so. A lot of times, though, we see that there's a fight over resources. Here's an example of a fight between Kuwait and Iraq. Of course, if you look um, right on the boundary of the Iraqi-Kuwaiti border, you can see one of the largest oil fields in the world, the Ramallah oil field. And um, both of them kind of have a lot of disputes over those resources. There are four steps to establishing a boundary. To uh, have a boundary, the first is that you have to define the boundary. Defining the boundary is actually writing out a legal document that lists the actual points in the landscape or latitude and longitude coordinates for the boundary. The second is to delimit the boundary. That means to have a cartographer, a professional, go in and actually draw the map of where that legal document stated those boundary lines were. The third is to demarcate the boundary. A state will go in and they will actually build some sort of you know, signage or a fence or pillars that mark where that boundary is. And the last is to administrate the boundary. Administrating the boundary means this is you actually operate the boundary. You decide who comes in and out, what they need to come in and out, um, what kind of goods you're going to allow to cross those borders. Those are border crossings. That's administrating the boundary. So those are the four steps. Remember, we're going to define it, delimit it, demarcate it, and administrate it. So when we look at boundaries, there's a couple types. We've got geometric boundaries, which are always going to be straight lines. They use latitude and longitude lines or township and range lines. And then physical political boundaries. Those are going to follow some sort of physical feature of the land, like a river. You can always tell a physical political boundary because they'll be curvy. All right. Now, um, the next one we want to talk about are some other types of boundaries. We've got antecedent boundaries. Antecedent boundaries were boundaries that existed before humans um, were inhabiting the area. So like a river or a mountain range or obviously an ocean or sea. The next is a subsequent boundary. Subsequent boundaries happen when settlement occurs. When settlement occurs, we actually draw those lines like the boundary between the United States and Canada. Superimposed boundaries are forcible boundaries. They are placed on a group of people by outsiders. Think about the word imposed, all right? Imposed means that it was forced on them, okay? And an example is going to be something we're going to study coming up, the Berlin Conference. And then the last is a relic boundary. That's something that no longer functions. It's an old boundary. An example would be like the Great Wall of China. It's not the boundary, the northern boundary for China, but it used to be, and everybody knows where it is today. Or the Berlin Wall doesn't exist anymore. It's not even there, but everybody knows where it was. And so that's the last type of boundary. Okay, so that's it for today. Thank you.